Um, and Hello. Frank, can, we'll can you, you guys hear me well? Yep, we can see you. We can see your slides. Uh, so go ahead. Okay, um, I am charged here to talk about the Open Science Data Federation. So let's, um, uh, let me see, uh, that, there we go. Let's dive right in. Um, this is a picture of the current deployment. The OSTF is uh, as deployed today is 20 caches, six of which are in the research and education network backbone. And it has about 10 data origin, including one in Europe. And you can find this is map. If you go to the OSG website, uh, look for OSDF, uh, the Open Science Data Federation, and voila, you click on the link and you see the real-time version of this, uh, this picture, except that you, what you see is actually the zoomed in version onto uh, uh, the US, but uh, you can use that to zoom out and just see the entire world as in this picture. Now, it has two components, origins and caches. Origins is what we call a place that owns data. That's where uh, data is, is resident. Caches are places by which data is accessed. Um, by having a network of caches that spans the entire USA, we can provide access to any data that lives in any origin from anywhere. The, the goal ultimately is any data, anytime, anywhere, um, uh, as uh, we cornily call it. Um, this is where we're heading. So two slides ago, this is where we're at. And you can see if you were to zoom into the US, um, uh, continental US, it's a little bit haphazard, um, meaning there are entire areas of the continental US that are badly covered. And this is where we're heading later on this year. We're heading in by, by a deployment date is, is, if I remember correctly, something like June or July this summer. And so by, let's say by fall 2022, we will have deployed eight additional caches via this NSF uh, award. And that will then allow any location within the continent of the USA to be within 500 miles of a cache. I put any in, 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 in question uh, because you can sort of see there are some places like here or like here or like here that are outside these, these circles. And the circles is my poor man's version of drawing a circle of 500 miles on top of a map around the center, which is a pop of internet two or one of these three data centers. And um, uh, so caches will be located in the center of these circles and uh, voila, 500 miles is about what you see. So it's, a, it's the best tessellation of the USA that uh, uh, we could come up with. So, what do you get out of the functionality of Android origin? What can a data origin actually do? And that uh, uh, speaks a little bit to what Benedict's question was a moment ago in, in, in chat. Uh, you can export, the, the most obvious and simple thing is you can export your data read only into the Data Federation. Um, it, the uh, mental model is that you have a file system. In that file system, there's the file system namespace. And out of that, some of you want to export, some of you you don't want to export. So you can change what you export dynamically anytime you want. Data can be public or private. The origin uses HTTPS as protocol. And therefore, by joining the Data Federation with an origin, you automatically get an HTTPS server for free. So uh, you're not required to use it, the OSTF in any way, shape or form as part of OSG. You can just use it, it, it uh, tell your friends who don't use OSG in any way, shape or form, um, here's my HTTPS server, knock yourself out. Um, there are of course issues regarding authentication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that has to be managed, but that's a detail. Uh, in addition, you can store output data produced on OSG. You can put by HTTPS, as part of the Ichikonda workflow, Brian talked about that in his uh, in the talk that just preceded mine. Um, you can do this authorized only to those people you want to support, um, and then those same directories that you're writing into may or may not be read-only access as, uh, exported again via the first step. So, in essence, you can make this a, a an active data area that you produce data, put data uh, into park later in your uh, workflow, use it again uh, reuse, uh, and use the data for post-processing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You do anything that you can imagine that you do with a DAG in essence. Um, 
there's one detail that is worth pointing out, and that is how the namespace is managed. Um, OSDF has a global namespace that is fundamentally separate from the origins that hold the data. Um, those of you who are familiar with XOD know how this works um, uh, because that's the technology under the hood. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this, you can actually move data between origins via HTTPS without changing how the data is accessed by the OSDF. Meaning the namespace location, how you address it a piece of data does not change just because you've moved data around, possibly around the entire globe. And uh, that also means implicitly that um, you can build replicas, you can have, have a replica of the same thing at the same name in Europe and another replica in the US and a third replica in, in China for all I care. Um, and so uh, that allows you, that gives you a lot of power and uh, allows for interesting things to do. For example, you could have a, a single researcher produce data, store it on their local storage system. That is an origin in the OSDF. And then when they're done and have validated it, they wanna curate it, but they don't wanna uh, use their storage anymore. So they wanna give it to somebody else for, uh, to uh, host it. And voila, this can be done without anybody even noticing because the access stays the same as long as the namespace stays the same. Um, let me uh, talk a little bit about um, who is using the Data Federation. In 21, uh, there were 92 research groups, nine collaborations and one campus that read 32 petabytes of data out of a working set of 420 terabytes for an average reread factor of 75. And what I've done here is I've made a histogram of the number of projects and the reread factor they had. This is sort of a poor man's log scale of some funny way, but not. Um, and I, I wanted to give you just sort of a sense. It literally spans the entire gambit from some data is just used incredibly often and some data is reused almost not at all. Then a slight aside on, on working set is a name that I am told is a standard computer science term. So I'm not using it quite the way that the people use it in computer science. I wanted to define what I'm saying. I just use it as a convenient thing that alludes to something that people have in their heads. Um, what we really mean is the sum of sizes of all unique files accessed by the data federation within a given time period. For example, if Jane Doe writes the file foo, and then accesses the file foo, then deletes the file foo, and writes the file foo2 in its set, its set and accesses the file foo, then file foo and foo2 never exist at the same time in, in, in reality because they use the same storage. Well, but we will still count them as, a, as part of the same working set because they were accessed at some point and they're distinct. Um, so in that sense, here's a table of top users by data read the working set that they have had in the year and how, and then the ratio between the two as a reread multiplier. And you can sort of see that, you can see multiple things from this. First of all, you can see that there's an enormous dynamic range in, in, in rereading. The rereading habit from different people is very, very different. And that's okay, um, it all works. Uh, similarly, the people who have an enormous reread tend to have small working sets. The people who have a small reread tend to have large working sets. That's probably also understandable. Um, and finally, if you just order them by data read, the people who read the most data tend to be large collaborations, but we're starting to see a few individuals, individual small groups that actually have sizable reading and sizable use of the OSDF. In fact, if I order this by the working set, there were 17 projects that have greater than terabyte working set. And 11 of these 17 projects are actually individual researchers or small groups. So in other words, the OS pool community is starting to be a very significant user of the data federation. Um, uh, whereas the dominant, the biggest users in terms of data read are still the uh, large collaborations. How do you join your data? You can join your data in two ways. Either, you put your data on an origin that we support, meaning path supports, or 
you can federate the file system of your institution with the OSDF. And that second one is probably the more interesting one. Therefore, that's what I'm talking about next. So the mental model that we have for this is that your data origin sits at your institution and it's just nothing more than a file system. Think of it as mental model, a Ceph file system or an NFS file system or Lust or whatever you want, doesn't matter. Some file system. Then that file system may or may not be behind your institutional firewall. That's allowed. And then there is a piece of hardware. Let's say it is, there is an institutional firewall and your file system is behind your institutional firewall. That, then there's a piece of hardware that you own and are responsible for racking up, powering up, network connecting. And at that point, you can hand it over to us, meaning you can decide that you don't want to have anything to do with having to operate the service. You don't even want to be responsible for the operating system. So you make this piece of hardware available to us via IPMI. We then spool on there everything. Um, we make it part of a Kubernetes system that we operate. We then have the path team put on the services on here that implements the data origin according to what you want this data origin to do. You might even put into this piece of hardware some NVMe to implement a cache if that's useful to you because you might have a, a compute cluster behind the, your firewall somewhere or, 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 or outside your firewall, wherever you place it in order to make this work with OSG. And voila, you can get something, an origin in the simplest possible way where you have full control because you might make a read-only export of this file system such that we really can do nothing other than export data into the world at large. Um, there is a solicitation by the NSF right now that has a due date of June 27th, where the NSF is willing to fund you to build things like this. In other words, buy this piece of hardware here in red and buy whatever you implement this with. And um, this is a solicitation offers $500,000 over two years. It allows for up to 25% of labor. I translate that into 375K hardware, 125K of labor. And then the solicitation says, um, at least 20% of this is, uh, this is actually verbatim, at least uh, out of the solicitation, at least 20% of this storage space on the proposed storage system must be made available as part of the chosen federal data sharing fabric. And OSDF is one of the possible ways to do that. Now, um, uh, I read this and so have many other people, and then we all scratch our heads and what did the NSF mean with this? And so I'm making some, uh, making it up like anybody else can make it up. And so these are the kinds of things that I can think of that might have been in the, uh, in, uh, uh, um, that might be consistent with this solicitation. And um, I've had now, I wanna say three or four meetings with people who want to respond to this solicitation. And this is the kind of thing that we discuss in these meetings. Um, this is the, basically the, the advice that I've given to people who want to respond to this and contact us um, via the CC Star uh, listserv that, that we maintain. Um, you can either use some of the stores to share current institutional data with the public. So that's the read only part. Personally, I would find it exciting if this led to OSDF being used for making curated data available, including fair principles. So I would think that this already satisfies the solicitation because it allows libraries, for example, to get in the game. It builds things on top of OSDF that we've never had in the same way. Um, and so I would find it very exciting as a, a path forward. The next one is you could use some of the storage as a cache space for the OS pool use of the institutional computing resources. If you have an institutional computing resource that you're already making available by the OS pool, then putting a cache space as part of your storage that you're buying in here, that is obviously a, something that is a shared uh, capability and enhances, uh, so that makes a lot of sense for those institutions. So I could consider that part of the game. And the third one is um, using some of the storage as origin space for the OS pool community. In essence, this would give, this would say, here's um, a mount point 
we give this mount point, or maybe here's even an entire file system that is separate from the rest of what we bought. And we give this to uh, the OS pool community via um, path and voila, knock yourselves out. Path is responsible via the kind of mechanism that you've just seen and Brian discuss and voila, off we go. And um, you could also do all of the above or some combination of all of the above. Basically anything that makes sense given your particular situation at the institution where you're from. And of course I didn't time myself, but I'm done. Um, I hope that I have uh, been within time and there are time left for questions.